In vet school, I did a lot of externships and I had really great experiences and really good mentors and they gave me a lot of freedom and let me do a lot of stuff. And so I felt really confident about a lot of stuff and I wasn't afraid to be afraid. I wasn't afraid to be uncomfortable. I wasn't afraid to have to like look things up on VIN. Like I was like, you know, I'm not going to know everything, but I have a good foundation. I know where to go for the information. Like, I think I can do it. Hi guys, and welcome to the House Call Vet Cafe podcast. I'm Dr. Eve Harrison. I'm a full-time integrative concierge house call veterinarian in Los Angeles, and I help other vets to build their unique mobile practices on their terms. This podcast is for and by house call and mobile veterinarians. So it is meant to give our community a platform to connect, to share our stories, to lift each other up and to support each other. Most of us work solo as lone wolves, right? (laughs) So for me, it's been really powerful to be able to physically hear the voices of my colleagues from all over the world and to get a chance to feel that we truly are part of a community of very real other human beings who get it. While you may be alone in that little bubble of your own vehicle when you're on the road seeing patients, I welcome you to join our community by tuning into our own podcast when you're on your way to your next house call. Whether you're a super experienced house call vet with 30 years of experience, you're a brand new prospective house call vet just looking to get started, or you're house call curious, there will be something for you in this podcast. Each episode, you will hear interviews from other mobile veterinarians just like yourself who are doing unique and innovative things, vets who are sharing their stories, their struggles and challenges, and you can also look forward to hearing valuable information and perspectives from specialists and experts outside of our micro niche. And finally, if becoming a house call veterinarian is something that you've been thinking about exploring, or you're looking for some extra support getting your own mobile practice to feel more profitable and sustainable for you, check out the information in the show notes about my course and our above and beyond supportive private community for members only, plus our monthly group coaching sessions within the House Call Vet Academy. You can also check out my free public Facebook group, which is also called the House Call Vet Cafe, the same name as this podcast, and which is a warm and cozy community for mobile vets to support each other in professional and personal development, in creative entrepreneurship, and in friendship. So thank you guys for spending time with me today. Let's dive into the episode. If you're looking for help with ultrasound scanning, Whether that's choosing a new machine or developing your ultrasound skills, check out the First Opinion Veterinary Ultrasound website at fovu.co.uk for independent machine reviews and online and in-person teaching options. Fovu, simplifying ultrasound. Hi everyone, we have a really special guest today, Dr. Asia Sinistrero. Dr. Asia is an integrative house call veterinarian based in Seattle. She has advanced training, a lot of advanced training, and a lot of certifications in pain management, traditional Chinese veterinary medicine, rehab, animal chiropractic, massage, and a whole lot more. And we'll get into that in just a minute. In her independent solo practice, Sea to Sky Holistic Vet, which I love the name of that, She provides integrative care with a special focus on internal medicine, pain management, geriatric medicine, and hospice and palliative care. So welcome, Asia. I'm really glad you're here. Glad to connect with you again. It's been a little while. Welcome. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm so glad to be here. Yay. Okay, so first of all, well, actually, before my first question, I just wanted to let anyone who is not watching the YouTube version of this know that Asia has an amazing yellow background, like her, but I guess it's like the the color of your wall. And you told me the entire office is painted this color. And it's called what? Tell me the name of the color. The pink color is smiley face. It's like literally yellow smiley face color. And it's just really cool. So I just thought you should all know that before we dive into the show. So, (laughs) okay. So first of all, I did want to start out the show by asking what's your favorite snack to eat in the car? Granola bars. All right. All I right. <laughs> I have them on auto ship from Amazon. Okay. And what kind of granola bars do you like? So this was actually a whole thing. When I was in vet school, I went through this phase because I was so stressed that I couldn't eat a granola bar unless it had less than six grams of sugar. Oh. Anything more than that, I was like super nauseous. I was just so stressed. 
And so I just, I just still do that. So I found Kind Bars, the brand Kind. They're like under six grams of sugar. They're also still like basically adult candy bars. They're delicious. They have nuts, so they're good for you. So that's what I I like Kind Bars also. That's very interesting that sugar, like higher amounts of sugar would contribute to physical illness. Yeah, because I was just like living on such a precipice of like stress in vet school. But yeah, so the old granola bars that I bought from like, I don't know, Safeway or something were like 10 grams of sugar. And I was like, I can't eat these. I had to find like the saddest little like <laughs> only <laughs> granola bars and then I could make it. <laughs> I do very much relate to the precipice of eternal stress, bog of eternal stress. And <laughs> interestingly, that sugar has the exact opposite. I'm a complete sugar addict. And like when I'm stressed, like I go right, like bring the chocolate, bring the sugar, like dump the domino sugar away. <laughs> <laughs> or whatever but that's very interesting and so it, i mean you have a better problem to have because sugar is pretty bad for you <laughs> and so, so you seem to be self-regulating so thank you for sharing that and can you tell me a little bit about how you became a house call bed and what your journey was like and you know did you ever at some point switch away shift away from that precipice of insane stress yes fortunately i did <laughs> they're much better now <laughs> excellent Yes. Yeah, I actually started my house call practice straight out of vet school. Yeah, I had done a lot of mixed animal ambulatory work in vet school, done a lot of externships that way. And that was what I was interested in. And I did do my acupuncture training when I was in vet school. So I already knew I kind of wanted to do integrative stuff. And I applied, well, I looked at applying for a few jobs and I sent out some resumes and stuff. I was like, none of these are really what I want to do. So I was like, why don't I just do what I want to do? Like, why don't I just start the practice that I want to do? And and yeah, that's, that's it. And it's, it's evolved over time. It was originally like very mixed animal ambulatory, but now it's primarily small animal and it's much more integrative, like much more of the holistic modalities, obviously still conventional as well, but yeah. So it's, and it's still morphing and growing. It's, it's still living things. That is, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I relate to that so much. Our practices are so organically alive always growing that's so cool I had no idea that you started right out of school that's pretty badass how long have you been a vet since 2014 all right so wait what is that that's eight years eight years okay all right getting getting close (laughs) to that 10-year milestones yes I guess I'm 11 years out now like so last year I hit the 10-year milestone and it's really special it's like holy (laughs) shice like look at me look at me go I made it and so like Yeah. Congrats on 10 years coming up soon. That's a big one. (laughs) So I'm actually a little bit curious. I had a a bunch of questions to ask you, but now I'm curious to go a little bit more into what it was like starting your practice as a new grad. Like, that's really brave of you. And and I have people in the academy who are also like brand new grads, and I'm so proud of them. But like, there, there are unique challenges with starting your practice when you are just out of school. Like, so brave and so awesome. <laughs> yeah, I mean, some people may think it was a little, you know, ignorance is bliss, yeah, <laughs> that sort of thing. You're like, you don't even know what you're getting yourself into. There was definitely some of that. But yeah, no, I mean, I was actually super lucky when I was in vet school. I did a lot of externships and I had really great experiences and really good mentors. And they gave me a lot of freedom and let me do a lot of stuff. And so I felt really confident about a lot of stuff. And I wasn't afraid to be afraid. I wasn't afraid to be uncomfortable. I wasn't afraid to have to like look things up on VIN. Like I was like, you know, I'm not going to know everything, but I have a good foundation. I know where to go for the information. Like, I think I can do it. And yeah. (laughs) Ah, I love that, you know, not being afraid to be afraid. I think there's something really, really special about that. And I think that is one of the things that makes a good entrepreneur, I believe, that you embrace change, embrace learning, that kind of growth mindset, right? It sounds like Mm -hmm. you've got that. And I've always seen you as a very confident veterinarian. I mean, I haven't seen you in practice, but (laughs) just what I know about you, it's just cool to hear your story about how you got there and that you acknowledged what you didn't know. And that was a part of that learning curve and getting to where you are now. Like you can't have confidence without acknowledging what you don't know and leaning into that and doing the work to fix it, right? Or not fix, but to to work. Yeah, (laughs) yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, that's what one of my mentors was telling me, you know, when I was in vet school and everything, like, if you're not learning and growing, you're not challenging yourself, like that's stagnation. 
in like you, egg, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> in Chinese, and he wasn't even a Chinese medicine practitioner, but in Chinese, medicine, like we know stagnation is bad. Great. So yeah, no. And so that's why I'm like always learning and growing. And yeah, if you're not challenging yourself, if you're not like, oh, I've never heard of that. Let me go look that up. And you're probably not doing good stuff. You're just sitting there, you know? So yeah, you need to be challenged. You'd be learning, growing, you need to be uncomfortable sometimes. It's okay. Yeah, it is okay. And I did want to also add in, it just sort of popped into my head. I've had periods of time where I was stagnant because I was not healthy. You know, like I was in a place where I was just trying to survive. Yeah. And I think, I think you and I are very much on the same page about this. There are times where you have to survive and that comes first. And I I know you (laughs) understand that. So I wanted to kind of, for anyone who's listening, who feels, hey, I am stagnant. Am I bad? (laughs) It's like, no, of course not. Like, no, no, no. Yes. You want to get yourself to a healthy place. And then when you're in that healthy place, then you can grow and get out. I mean, it's not, it's not bad stagnation when you're treading water to survive. That's treading water to survive. Right. Yes. (laughs) Totally. So can you tell me a little bit about the process of getting onto the holistic track? So like, you've got a lot of certifications, like I don't know if I've seen anyone's name with more letters after it than yours, like anyone. (laughs) And I mean, like, perhaps congratulations to you. Like, how did that come about? And how did your interest in general in holistic medicine come about? Yeah, so I have to admit on all my certifications, I'm a very goal-oriented person. (laughs) I just need to have things that I'm working towards. Yeah. (laughs) Do not feel like you have to have all these certifications to, like, be holistic or integrative or do good stuff. You, you don't have to have all these things. I just like doing them. <laughs> so. It's cool. It's like yeah. boxes. It's like you're like, oh, I'm making progress. Yep. I, I, yep. I'm like, oh, I've got like a CE to do. I got to work on that. So oh, got a case report to do. I just, I just need to have stuff to do. Keep myself. Mm-hmm. No, but you don't have to. That's okay. But yeah, the holistic medicine. People always ask me that. Clients ask me that. Other vets ask me that. And I think because it's holistic, they expect that I must have had some sort of like transformational experience, like brought me to the holistic medicine. <laughs> There, there wasn't. Who cared about a mushroom trip or anything? <laughs> no, I didn't like you know have like a near death experience or no nothing like that. <laughs> no, and and honestly, there was no point at which I was like, I'm gonna do holistic medicine. It's just that I want to help patients and you know I want to learn stuff. And maybe there was a world in which I got super into ultrasound, radiology. I became a radiologist, but in this world, I you know went down that pathway and did more and more integrated modalities, and so. That's how I got where I am today. Yeah, I love that. And I mean, I think what you said about, you know, I just wanted to help patients and it seemed that was the path to do so. And you just kept going on it. Yeah. Yeah. If there's ways I can help patients, I want to learn about it. And then, you know, more modalities dovetailed into other ones. And like I say, like maybe if I had gotten super into ultrasound or super into surgery, like I would have done a bazillion things on that path. But this is the one I went down, so. Yeah. Yeah. This is the the holistic manifestation of your way of being as a pet. <laughs> yeah. And it just so happens you got on this path. That's cool. Can you tell me a little bit more about some of the modalities you do? Like what have you seen really helpful for your patients? What is maybe an unexpected thing that you didn't think would be helpful, but is, or, you know, tell me a little about that. So I'm like constantly surprised <laughs> how well this stuff is. I'm like, wow, they're doing really well. I guess good job, Dr. Asia. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's like moments with all these modalities. Like I remember, so nutrition actually is something I'm like super big on. Yeah. I'm all about the real food. I'll say that right now. Mm-hmm. I'm like, well, all about the real food. <laughs> sorry if that offends anyone. <laughs> but sorry, not sorry. And very not sorry. You know, and the patient <laughs> that taught me that, it was pretty early on. And it was this cat, the old cat. He had been on, you know, some sort of prescription crystal diet for like 10 years because like one time when he was two, there was crystals in his urine and now he's 16 and, you know, probably has diabetes slash lymphoma. He has renal disease, but he looks terrible. You know, he has cachectic and like his coat looks awful and it's like brown instead of black. And so anyways, you know, we talked about everything and differentials and all that and treatment options. And in the end, all I did I did a couple of acupuncture needles because he wasn't super into it. And we changed his food. We we're going to get rid of the kibble, get rid of the prescription diet. The owner wanted to do a commercial raw food. Not that I'm like, must be raw, but that's what she wanted to do. And I was like, okay, you might need to cook it, but we'll see. So yeah, we did all that. I came back in six weeks. He was like a normal cat. Incredible. 
Like his coat was beautiful again. His muscle was back. Like I'm sure he was full of lymphoma. But yes, he was several more years, did great, was super happy, looked great. Yeah, and I was like, whoa, <laughs> this stuff is real. Yeah, so, and for every modality, I have moments like that. Like the other day, I had a new cat patient, super like, er, like super crunchy, super crunchy kitty. And I was like, all right, we'll do all the stuff. So I did acupuncture, laser, massage, chiropractic, all that good stuff. Yeah. And then afterwards, it wasn't normal because it turned out she actually had neuropathy, which none of us realized because she was so busy walking so stiffly. So then she was walking like the taxic, but I was like, she's moving her joints. So her joints don't hurt anymore. That's awesome. Yeah. And I was like, wow, oh, good job, Dr. Rusha. <laughs> Yeah, no, massage is super powerful. Yeah, I one time got a dog, a laryngeal paralysis dog that was having pretty bad respiratory distress. I did a bunch of massage and like he could breathe again. Wow. Yeah. That's absolutely amazing. Can you tell me about what you think holistic and integrative medicine means to clients? Yeah, so clients, it varies. <laughs> so sometimes yeah. you think that means that I'm going to tell them like the magic dose that we all secretly know, but don't tell anyone of turmeric to cure cancer. <laughs> yeah. So I don't take those clients, but no, a lot of people are, you know, just looking for all the things they can do to help their pet, you know, and they get acupuncture for themselves and they try to eat healthy themselves and they just want all that for their pet too. So, yeah. it's awesome. I, as an integrative practitioner as well, have struggled with this quite a bit. I find that there are a lot of people who are kind of like what you described, the clients who don't take and who I also no longer take. But I had to learn the hard way by going through a lot of clients who, you know, thought there was magic. And, yep. you know, a lot of people come to holistic medicine from a place of denial or hatred of Western medicine, a yep. virgin to Western medicine. And it's not like, hey, I want to use this tool because it's another tool in the toolkit. It's another thing that can help. I am against Western medicine and I'm pro magic. And it's like, mm -hmm. like, well, <laughs> fresh out of the magic here. So can't help you. Yeah. And it's like, I don't have a crystal ball where I wave my hands and know the diagnosis. I mean, Chinese diagnosis, yes. And a lot of people find a lot of, I mean, I find that, you know, we always talk about how diagnosis is therapeutic, right? I think even psychologically, like having a Chinese medicine diagnosis is therapeutic for the caregiver of the animal because there's a name for it. Right. And I think it not only does it give us a whole plethora of other treatment options besides what's sort of like the standard routine Western thing, like Serenia, steroids, what, what have you. <laughs> you know, and I'm not a big steroid user, actually. I don't even know why I said that. But I guess like classically it has been. But it opens a whole door to different treatment modalities, but it also opens almost like a trust and an understanding and having the client feels almost held, like we have a name for this and therefore there's something we can do about it. Do you find that to be true as well? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. People, yeah, like that there's a diagnosis and that there's something that we can do. And I mean, even with like all the rehab and musculoskeletal stuff I do, I mean, just telling people, you know, he has something wrong with his nerves. We don't know exactly what it is, but there's definitely something wrong with his nerves. And here's how he can treat it, you know? Yeah, I think that gives people hope, not necessarily denial. I mean, denial and hope are like intricately <laughs> linked, aren't they? And I, I feel like as veterinarians in general, whether we're integrative, holistic, Western, we see a lot of that denial, hope kind of gray area. And we have to navigate that with our clients. And I do think that in my experience of being an integrative vet, I've seen a little bit more of it on the integrative side, the holistic side, where people don't fully understand what necessarily our capabilities are. But likewise, on the Western side, people also severely underestimate the capabilities, right? <laughs> Have you had that experience at all with clients or other practitioners who are, you know, doubting what you do or anything like that? Yeah, I mean, not really from clients, because again, I, I don't take those clients. I mean, yes, I've learned these all the, the hard way. So yes, I have it, but I don't I think it's the same. <laughs> yeah. With the other vets, it's better than it used to be. When I first started it, it was definitely a lot of like eye rolling, like literal eye rolling. Mm -hmm. um, but no, it's definitely more accepted now. People refer and stuff and they'll 
say, oh, I think acupuncture would help your pet, you know, so it's definitely gotten better. But yeah, no, it's still pretty limited. It's like, oh, for arthritis in the spine, that's all it's for. I think when there's so much more. Yeah, there's just not a lot of understanding of what any of these things. I mean, a lot of vets don't understand what chiropractic is. Um, I don't understand what chiropractic is. Can you tell me, actually? Yes. I've, yeah. I'd like to be very <laughs> honest. Like, I've never been to a chiropractor because I'm scared, but I have considered <laughs> doing chiropractic training because, hey, maybe it can be helpful for my patients. But I don't understand. Like, can you explain yes. it to me? <laughs> yeah. So it is range of motion of the vertebral joints. So it's just like you do passive range of motion, joint mobilizations on, you know, stifles, hips, all of those things. It's that, but it's on the vertebral joints. It's always within normal range of motion. It's not painful. It's not scary. It's not back cracking. It's literally just you check range of motion on a spinal joint. And if it's not moving properly, you do a joint mobilization, just like you would do on, on an extremity joint. So yeah, that's, that's it. Very cool. I'm curious. I'm really into a lot of these sort of like mind body techniques. Like obviously I teach yoga, but I'm also really into like Pilates and Feldenkrais and Alexander technique. And there's like a new one called, well, maybe it's not new, but it's new to me. (laughs) Oh, what is it called? Franklin technique, (laughs) Franklin method. (laughs) That's what it's called. Are you familiar with any of those? And are the movements in those types of techniques in overlap with chiropractic mobilization in any way? Are there any similarities? Yeah, yeah. So I'm not like super familiar with them, but I do have several clients who do like build and crafts and stuff um, and do a lot of body work and stuff. And yes, it, it is similar. And actually human PTs, physical therapists, they will do spinal joint mobilizations. They call it that so they don't get in trouble with the chiropractors, but it's basically chiropractic. It's just like how they do dry needling and they don't call it acupuncture so they don't get in trouble with the acupuncturist, but like it's acupuncture. So yeah, no, it's joint mobilizations. It's, it's just joint mobilizations of the spine. That's really cool. I did watch a video one time about how to do a chiropractic or about a dog getting chiropractic adjustment. And I saw that they were, you know, manipulating the spine, but also like the paws and the the limbs. Is that also part tail and the neck? Is that also part of it as well? Yeah. Yeah. So, and honestly, that's where it blends into like rehab in a lot of ways. So in like rehab, you learn how to like, you know, check all the joints and do compression and mobilizations and everything. And that's what chiropractic is, except it's on the spine. But it's really funny because neither of them like talk to each other. So when you're doing pack training, we don't talk about the spine or the back at all, even though that's like crazy important. Um, but they don't talk about it because the human PTs aren't trained in that because that's chiropractors. And so because we're getting all this from like the human side, like we also have created that like arbitrary distinction that like rehab is all about the limbs, it's all about the limbs when it's not. And then, yeah, chiropractic, they do talk about the extremities and like you learn how to mobilize them and stuff. But yeah, it's kind of like bonus to the last module. It's like, all right, and we'll teach you this too, but like mostly it's about the spine. But no, like once you do both, you're like, oh, la, la, la. now I can treat all of the joints and the whole body. Excellent. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. I love that your broad and diverse training allows you to integrate all of those techniques into like a truly holistic practitioner that you are, right? And so now I'm curious, what kinds of results have you seen from chiropractic? Yeah. So, I mean, nothing like that. I know, I know <laughs> you're not doing any one thing in isolation. So that's all right. Hard to right. Say. Yeah. No. And like for everything that I do, people always talk about you know, down dachshund and, you know, I did acupuncture and he was cured and like, that doesn't happen. The reason people tell you about that is because it was like very unusual, like in real life. Like, yeah. So, so sometimes I'm like, you know, I get imposter syndrome and I'm like, am I even helping anyone here? Like, am I just some witch doctor? But then I'm like, oh wait, when I first saw that dog, he literally couldn't walk. We used to help him up harness to get him up off the couch. And then we did everything. We did massage and Cairo and acupuncture and rehab. And at the next appointment, he was walking and got off the couch himself. So yeah, I wouldn't call it a miracle, but like definitely helps. Yeah. (laughs) Can we talk about imposter syndrome a little bit more? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Like I'm pleased. (laughs) I don't really know a single vet who professes not to have ever felt like an imposter. But since you brought it up, I'd love to hear your thoughts on it and, you know, like what that means for you and and maybe how you think through it yeah no i mean yeah we we all get imposter syndrome 
yeah, I just try to remind myself of all the times like, oh no, I did something and a patient got better and like, it was me. <laughs> like, I don't think it was coincidence. I don't think it was placebo. Like, I think it was me. And even if the patient like didn't get better, like I think of all the times, like my clients are so amazing. They like literally tell me, thank you so much. You make such a big difference. I see you. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> yeah, but even if you're doing like, in home euthanasias, if you just think about all the people who were like, thank you so much. You made this so beautiful. This was so peaceful. Like, yeah, we all have good experiences. We're like, oh, yeah, no, we, we do a good job. Totally, totally. You and I, I think, are potentially the most selective client selectors on the planet. And I... <laughs> I feel a camaraderie with you because I'm likewise extremely selective. And if it's not like a wonderful, wonderful client who makes me feel happy and good, they're out. <laughs> yeah, you just don't have time for that in your life. Like there's no time for anything less than, mm -hmm. than feelings. So. Yeah, so I commend you on that. And I wanted to ask my next question, which we've gotten into a little bit. Can you tell me about any challenges you've faced as a holistic or integrative vet? either from the medical perspective or the client perspective or the professional community perspective? Yeah, I mean, again, like I was confident from the beginning. I was just like, well, I'm going to do what I'm doing. I know that I provide good care. This is specialty level care. If you don't like it, if you think it's quackery, then, then don't do it. That's funny. I'm going to do me. So that part doesn't bother me that much. Yeah, the client stuff, you know, I think that's part of why I got so good at being like, this is not going to be a good fit. And I just shouldn't do that because that is just a waste of my time and their money. It's just unnecessary emotional aches for everyone. You have experienced that, worked through it and learned those lessons. Is that yeah. right? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I did. Yeah. Yeah. No, so many, so many mistakes were made. <laughs> oh God, I know. <laughs> but they were learning experiences. Yeah, no, every time I'm like, how can I prevent that from happening in the future? But yes, that is how I kind of came to be so selective and recognize like, oh, that's not going to work. That's a red flag. This is just not going to be the right fit. Yeah. So now things are in like a great place. All my clients are excellent. I only take new clients if they also are going to be excellent. So yeah. That's awesome. So can you tell me, speaking of mistakes, I relate to that wholeheartedly. I have no shame about admitting <laughs> the the processes that I went through that were very painful and got me to where I am today. Can you tell me if there's anything you wish you'd known when you started your house call practice or anything that you would have done differently or resources or, you know, anything like that? Yeah, there's so many like little things. But I think the big thing is just realizing like you can have it all. You can. <laughs> like, yeah, like, yeah, you can have the schedule you want. You can have the clients you want. You can have the life balance you want. Yeah, I mean, you come straight from like vet school, like, which was, you know, obviously super toxic and awful. You know, some of my mentors were like good and like, were like, oh, I don't take emergencies from on clients and like had some boundaries, but a lot of them were still very like, well, I work seven days a week because that's what you do. And I miss family stuff because that's what you do. And just like, if I just realized from the beginning that I didn't have to do that and like that I could set boundaries and that you're allowed to not take clients, you're allowed to not answer the phone, like, yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> that would have made things so much better the first few years. But yeah, realizing that you can have it all just because that's the way we've always done it. That's what it's like. Like, no, that's not how it has to be. It could be the way you want it. Thank you for saying that, like, from the bottom of my heart, because that is like, <laughs> that is like my mantra, basically, and kind of undoing that sort of almost learned helplessness that we've yeah. gotten from our mentors from vet school, maybe our internship or residency. <laughs> And that you can't have it all and that you can't, yeah. I mean, I guess I would amend that you can, you can have it all just not at the same time is one phrase that people say so yeah. that people don't kind of put pressure on themselves to feel like they're failing if they don't have it all. Like, just yeah, like, like, like that, I would like, you can't have it all. You, you don't need to have it all right this second, but there you, you go. can have it all. <laughs> yeah, you don't need to have it all. I think that's an important clarification, too, because I always, like, try and think through, like, myself listening to this back when I was in a first place, like, how could I possibly have taken that wrong? <laughs> you know, like... <laughs> Um, and you're not like failing if you don't at this very moment have it all together and have everything exactly the way you want it but you're not failing it's okay to want all of those things it absolutely is and it's possible to have it and you know like don't sell yourself short people please please know like you can do this like 
if Asia and I could do it, you know, like coming from some of the traumatic experiences we've had and we've made it, like you can do it too. You can have this. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. That's great advice. Can you share your top three tips on providing integrative or holistic care on a house call basis? Yeah. So I think the big one would just be to own it, like with everything you do. I think it makes me sad when I care about people who are like, oh, you know, I did acupuncture training, but I just never use it. No, like you, you did this, you have this treatment that can help. And it's like, use it, sell it, do it. Don't leave it for like, oh, well, ibuprofen isn't working anymore. I guess we could just be trying acupuncture. I guess, I don't know. No, the, the first thing to do is acupuncture. The first thing to do is massage. Like, yeah. Yeah. So just, just own it. Don't be like embarrassed to offer it. Don't be like, oh, well, you know, if you're open-minded, we could maybe think about some acupuncture. Just be like, all right, well, acupuncture would be a treatment that we could do. Like carpal would be a treatment that we could do. Like it's one of your treatments. You offer the treatments and donors choose what they want to choose and decline what they want to decline. Love it. Fantastic. Any other tips? You got two yes. left. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So my other tip would be that you can be as fancy or low tech as you want. Because I think people are afraid sometimes to like learn rehab. Because Oh, well, I don't have a facility, so I would never use it. No, no. Like if you want to have an underwater treadmill and a trailer, you can. That is an option. You can do that. But also you don't need that. You could do rehab without an underwater treadmill. Like I bring two foam yoga things into my appointments and like some homemade cavalettis. And like, mm -hmm. and honestly, most of the time I don't use that. Most of the time I just use like my body and the couch and pillows. So yes, you, you could do all of that. Like high tech, low tech, like you, you can do it all. It, it's fine. Don't like to think that you can't. And same, I mean, this is true of other modalities too. Like ultrasound, people are like, oh, I can never do whatever. Like, yeah, bring it home. You could do it. So I'm like brick and mortar vets are like, how can you do vaccines at home without 10 people to hold them? You can do it. <laughs> yes. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. And then my pro practical tip, if you're going to do acupuncture at home, buy the needles out of the plastic colored handles and buy a magnetic pickup tool. Good. Are you talking about the Siren needles? Are you a Siren user? Well, I'm, I'm a Siren fan. I'm Team Siren. But there's two kinds of acupuncturists. There's acupuncturists who like sticky needles and there's acupuncturists who don't like sticky needles. I am no sticky needles. So mm. I understand some people like the sticky. If that's you, do you. But there's the Jing Tang ones are sticky and they have plastic color handles too. But yes, I'm a Saren girl. That's funny. I am, I am also a Siren girl and I did start out with the Jing Tang ones. And, you know, I like those also, but the packaging for some, I don't know why, but the packaging... <laughs> I don't know, but I, I love everything else Jing Tong. So like, whoop, whoop, <laughs> Jing Tong, love it. Everything Chi Institute, love everything Chi Institute. But I am a Siren girl as well. So I will uh, agree with that. Can you tell me what kind of like magnetic tool you have? So what you literally you just like go on Amazon or like magnetic pickup tool. There's all these telescoping little magnets. They're for like people who are like using your shop. They're all post pictures of people like picking up screws with them and stuff. But yeah, it's just like this little telescoping tiny metal thing. And on the end of it is like a magnet. So you can just sweep that along the couch, like sweep it under the couch, sweep it along carpets for when they like shake and it goes flying. So yeah, it's helpful to just mm. Awesome. For folks who don't do acupuncture, the reason we're talking about a magnetic pickup tool is if the needles fall out or the dog shakes, sometimes you can't find the needles and it's really hard. So I, another reason that I love Siren needles because the little plastic handles are red for most of the patients that I treat and it's easier to see. And one last question about the acupuncture needles or yes. I guess about acupuncture in general. Yeah. For me, I feel like acupuncture and the Chi Institute, my experiences there were completely invaluable for my house call practice. Like, I think it just really added something incredibly special. Do you feel that way as well? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, like I said, I actually did all of the training except the final like test module in vet school. And so yeah, it became part of how I practice medicine is including Chinese medicine diagnostics and that like understanding of Chinese medicine physiology and pathology. All of that is just part of how I've always practiced medicine. And just, you know, the focus on really close observation and, you know, taking in environment and personality and, you know, all of these other factors, it is just so important to understanding, you know, what's going on with patients and also just the understanding. I talk about this with other house call vets a lot, but you don't realize when you're in a clinic what people's lives are like. 
you know, but then in the home, you see all of a sudden like, oh, okay, her disabled son lives here. And, you know, there's just all of these other things that you just don't know when you're at the clinic. And so when you're like, oh yeah, give this three times a day. Um, and you ask them, you're like, is that doable? And they're like, yeah, yeah, I can do that. Because, you know, you're a doctor and they want to do the right thing. And so they're like, yeah, I can do that. But but really they they can't, they, they can't do that. And so, yeah, like just being in the home and just like seeing everything, seeing the patient, seeing the caregiver, just understanding the whole situation. I do think a lot of that comes from the Chinese medicine and just that, you know, you really need to be a keen observer and really take in all of these signs, look at the environment, just look at the whole picture. Yeah. In order to understand everything that's going on and like what treatments are actually going to make sense. And I think part of it too is like how in Chinese medicine, there's so many options. There's 10 acupuncture points you could do for any given issue. And a lot of conventional that struggle with that, they're like, but which one do I do? But which one do I do? (laughs) Any of them are good. But yeah, just having that understanding of like, there's a lot of ways we can help, you know, and like when I'm doing rehab, like, oh, that exercise isn't going to work. Okay. There's another one we can do. And just like having that ability to like be agile and to balance and be like, oh, that medication is not going to work. Let's do something else. That treatment's not going to work. Let's do something else. Totally. To quote Dr. Shia, it depends, period. Yes. (laughs) Anyone who's been through the Chi Institute will get that. (laughs) That's so awesome. And I I have to say, I'm like so jealous that part of your vet school training incorporated that sort of mentality and that approach to healing even. You know, I feel like when I went to acupuncture school, it completely revamped my brain as a doctor. I mean, it allowed a whole new way of being with the patient and the client in a way that's almost like somehow less judgmental and creates the space and the openness for you to practice from that non-judgment and from that almost wellness yourself by embracing those principles and that approach to your patients. You know, like I felt very much when I, you know, got to Chi Institute, I don't know, I'm like obsessed with Chi Institute right now, but I really am. It it changed my life and I know you're a fan too. So I'm kind of going at it here. When I got there, like The first day I was there, I was like, okay, this is what healing is. This is what healing is. This is a place that is not traumatizing me. Yeah, (laughs) traumatized me. How am I to provide well-being, health, and holistic care from a place of trauma myself? Like how? You know, and so I found that that whole paradigm shift was like absolutely critical in my development as a veterinarian. Do you have any, you know... So like, yeah. I mean, it's just so cool that you, you hatched from the vet school egg with that tool and that paradigm in your, yeah. head, you know? So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, don't give the vet school too much credit. It's not like they like, I just went and did it on my own. Yeah. <laughs> but, but still, yes, having that as part of my formative vet years, I think a lot of my like, you know, importance of boundaries and self-care and stuff does come from that because yeah, they talk so much about like, you need to be in a good place. Like you need to have your chi in a good place. Like you can't help if you have all this like negative and like sickness yourself. I'm talking a lot about intentions. Mm. Yeah. And how important intentions are. That's a really big thing I learned about with clients is just recognizing like when they don't have good intentions, we can't just that realization. Like if they don't think that steroids are going to help, like we can't do steroids, no matter how helpful they are, they're not going to help because the caregiver doesn't think they're going to help. So we yeah. can't do that. And just like understanding their intention is so important and my intention is so important and making sure that I'm in a good place mentally, physically, emotionally to be able to like do healing work. It's much easier to heal when I'm in a good place myself and like all of that. I think a lot of that comes from the Chi Institute for sure. A hundred percent. I agree. If there's a client that is resistant to doing a certain treatment or medication, it may or may not work, but I know that whatever (laughs) happens, they're going to blame that treatment. Yeah, whatever does or doesn't yeah. happen, yeah. <laughs> yeah. especially yeah. if it's bad. <laughs> yeah, there's no point in like arguing if their mind is made up, they'll have bad intentions and bad things will just happen. No, no matter what, bad things will happen. So yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, absolutely. So closing up for the day, can you tell me, since we are in the House Call Vet Cafe, what is your favorite <laughs> beverage to drink? Well, <laughs> I, I thought a lot about this. Well, I could drink. Yeah, I mostly drink water. But then I was like, oh, I do enjoy bubble tea. So yeah, that's probably my best. Like, yeah, bubble tea, like milk tea, bubble tea. We have a bunch of bubble tea places here in Seattle. They're like super fancy. And I'm like, I like to go to different ones and try different things and like 
what's 25% sugar versus like 50% sugar to try like the <laughs> aloe jelly instead of the bubble jelly and just like try all the different things. So yeah, that's, that's like my special treat for myself is buy myself a $10 boba. <laughs> I mean, it's like kind of like a dessert, isn't it? It's so much fun. All the it's, choices. I'm a huge boba fan. I haven't had boba tea or like a bubble tea for ages, but yeah, I, I, you know, <laughs> I went to Seattle once and I do remember that about Seattle. Seattle in general is a very cool place. So it, I'll have to come meet you there for bubble tea sometime. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. This has been a really awesome interview. And I think the holistic and integrative perspective that you have to offer is so beneficial for people, whether they are considering doing integrative work, they are an integrative practitioner, or even if they're not at all. I think all of this information is so valuable. And I thank you for your wisdom and your time. So thanks again. Yeah, you're welcome. Glad to help. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the House Callback Cafe. If you enjoyed this episode, then hit the subscribe or follow button on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts so you never have to miss an episode. This podcast is made specifically for you, so don't be shy if you'd like to reach out and let me know your thoughts on this episode. You can find me on Instagram and Facebook as The House Callback Academy, where I also share more valuable content. If you're interested in learning more about consulting for House Call Vets or the House Call Vet Academy online course and community, please click on the link in the show notes. Have an amazing rest of your day, and I can't wait for you to join us for our next episode of the House Call Vet Cafe.